in particular for metrics there are already practices and mm. for PIDs you may have people who have uh, specific systems and we have to understand how this connects the, the whole world. Yeah. Okay. And this is where the unexpected adverse consequences can happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think I'll move us on again to the next slide. So just for some general comments on these stakeholders or, or others. I don't know if anyone maybe thinks there were certain groups missing there, or perhaps some of the ways in which we're consulting or you know doing this work currently doesn't engage certain groups well enough and that we need to rethink you know, how we connect with scientific communities or how we try and avoid those adverse consequences. always takes a bit longer to to think of um comments you might put here yeah academic publishers that's a good point we hadn't put publishers in that list of stakeholders Yeah, and I think that's is a good point about the RIs and the clusters there. They're useful as brokers, but not for all. I think this is one of the, the reasons I'd maybe try and think about the end user as well, not, you know, trying to make sure we're connecting with people, even if they're not working through certain infrastructures. Okay, so I'll give this just another minute or so. Um, global stakeholders, yeah. I think it's important to try and make sure we're aligning and also flagging the RDA there as well. Mm, to see if I can yes, the young people are important because they are more easily uh, knowledgeable about things which happen on, on the internet but it's not so easy to find them and to make to to manage to make them talk speak up uh, coming as i am from a library as well i'm glad to see that someone's highlighted the role of research library in all of this as as a key part of research infrastructure yeah yeah, I know. I like this comment here that we've got the right stakeholders, but it's useful to dig a bit deeper to think about the specific roles and the needs. Yeah, and the management of universities are important in the metrics question. Yes, yeah, research, gonna... they are research organizations, so we have to, to take into account all the research enabling organizations, including universities. And we have a comment in the chat as well on the research infrastructures of service providers. I think with a lot of these groups, there are, you know, there's overlaps um, between these stakeholders. So, so what we wanted to think about next is the kind of information that needs to be gathered and we've, we've put some general um, options here to, to kind of choose between, you know, the feedback um, on implementation, the kind of challenges that might be encountered when people are trying to apply the policy, the PID policy and the metrics, any kind of unclear or missing aspects um, things we've overlooked or how we can improve on on that or there might be other things that you're considering as well either from having looked at the documents already or so most votes here coming in for challenges and recommendations One person with a thought on other, I don't know if they want to note what it is, either um, unmute or pop in chat. Well, I think we actually, I think we've got a free text question in a minute that we can pick that up on. Yeah. 
Yeah, so most most coming in here for the recommendations. I think, yeah, that's the most important thing, really, trying to understand what's not working, how we can improve the policy and, and the metrics. And uh, it's built on uh, feedback from implementation and challenges encountered anyways. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to see those two quite close together because you would probably expect that most feedback on implementation people would want to give would be challenges in implementation essentially yeah yeah or things which do not work it can be not a challenge just something which doesn't work yeah yeah exactly okay and i'll just move us along the best ways to gather this information so we've we've been using a number of um a number of different methods as we've been um doing consultations so far um so actually in terms of us we've we've been putting the documents up for review and getting written responses or we've presented at events and run run kind of workshops and we're planning webinars um other groups have done surveys um we've also had interviews when we've developed the interoperability framework um and one in the current EOS structure, there's obviously the governance board as well as the exec board. Um, so there's ways to, to gather feedback um, via the, the governance board members as well. But it'll be useful to try and know which methods work best for people um, and try and focus on those more in, in the future. So we've got here the community workshops going up most highly working groups um, with targeted members invited to those it's actually still an open question on on how we um you know set up the structures for for eos going forward at the moment we've got these working groups and i think that's that's worked very well for developing the policy maybe we need some kind of continuation of that for the implementation phase so groups that will address the metrics and um look at reviewing these aspects yes it's clear that it seems that a combination of uh, working groups and uh, webinars more more open webinars is something which could be envisaged yeah so sarah are you able to comment on the approach to inviting members to the existing working groups for this round just to give people a bit of context yeah, sure. So, so the way this was done um, currently, the governance board, um, essentially every country could nominate somebody to the different working groups. Um, and most of the nominations came in that way. Um, some groups um, changed that slightly. So um, I added a number of members for the fair because, I mean, we, we had a good representation from the governance board, but there were certain skill sets that I wanted to make sure were included and also balance in terms of the, the geography um, and career stage and gender balance. So, so I added a number of members as well. Um, and within the architecture working group, there's various represent representatives from different projects. Um, so it'd be good to, to think about how we target those groups. You know, for me, it's really important that people have good knowledge of the area, you know, so around the PIDs and, and the metrics, for example. That's why Rachel and Francoise have both been involved and various other members. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's good to get feedback on how we structure those in future as well. One thing that's intriguing me about this poll is that the structured consultation um, with written responses is the lowest because that's mainly what we've been doing so far. So possibly that isn't working well for people. I know sometimes when you get a big document um, to read, it's hard to, you know, hard to compose your feedback. So maybe we do need to do more kind of workshops and webinars to try and gather in the thoughts or to, to pose specific questions around what we think are the most challenging aspects. I would say also that uh, we have to maybe facilitate the answers. Yeah. By allowing people to put notes in the document itself and so on, because yeah. it can be a bit difficult. Exactly. That's That's been one of the challenges we've had. There's been a a reluctance to put out Google documents. Um, so when we're publishing PDFs, it's a lot harder to comment directly on the text. Um, so I think we maybe need to, you know, revisit some of those questions um, because people find it a lot easier to just annotate something directly. I also see a comment from Hilke in the chat 
the fact that uh, other may be also data on usage and I think it's really well put. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's really important for the metrics, yeah. Okay, so on me was through to... It says on mine that Anders raised his hand. Anders, do you want to just unmute and ask ah, a question? Yeah. yeah, thanks Rachel. Uh, yeah, hi, I just wanted to, to add to the, to that discussion that I think it, was, it came up uh, somewhere that it, it was important what the channels were for these structured uh, consultations that, that the PIT forum had worked well and we got loads of response, but some of the uh, documents that had only been communicated through the uh, ESC secretariat had got very little response, so that's probably something to consider. Yeah, definitely. Actually, that's if people might have comments to give on on that in this section now that we've got kind of a free text answer. Um, so one of my observations, um, I think the PID forum, it's, there's already a community of PID providers or people who are engaged in, in PID infrastructure there. And I think that really helped us with the PID policy because it's there's a ready community who would want to comment on that kind of document. Um, the liaison platform is quite new. I don't know how many people here have registered for the liaison platform, but I, I get the sense that maybe we're not um, reaching people in the same way when we've put other documents out. So if you have observations on, you know, where you expect to be consulted, like where, where are you looking for news about EOSC? You know, what kind of mechanism should we, we be using to get these documents out to you to comment on? Um, are there existing communities you're in, like the Research Data Alliance or GoFair or through the research infrastructures that we should be using more as well? Um, so if you've got any general comments on, you know, how we should be engaging, what, what kind of information we're gathering, anything on these last couple of questions that you want to add, by all means add that now. And while people are thinking about that, I was just going to mention that obviously on the previous slide, we had uh, quite a positive reaction towards the webinars and workshops. And as a little plug, on the 10th of June, we'll be running a consultation webinar for the second version of the PID policy. Um, I haven't put information about that out there yet because we just decided on the date uh, a few days ago. So um, I will uh, try and push information out about that workshop, but it is on the 10th of June for people to hold in their diaries. It'll just be an hour, hour and a half. Um, so look out for that. Yeah. So we've got a number of comments coming in now. So yeah, I, I think one of the things we really need to um, do is work through existing organisations. So research institutes, not just the university, engaging the clusters or existing global community platforms. I think I think that's really why the PID forum had worked very well, um, because it's an existing platform people are already on. Um, and I think the com the point about, you know, making it easy for people to comment, I think that's really important. Yeah, and I, I sense the frustration here, so many documents already available. Um, I found this too, there's so many things to comment on, it can, it can be very difficult with the amount of content coming out of EOSC. Shared interactive documents, practical interactions. Okay, so this form continues to remain open. So um, I'm going to just move us on, um, but you can continue to, to add comments in here if more things come up later. So this, um, I must admit, when we were composing the questions, this is one I found quite hard to think of an answer. So it might take you a little while to, to re reflect on this. But as we've mentioned, the current governance of EOSC ends at the end of this year. And we want to think about which body should be in charge of maintaining the PID policy and metrics going forward. So we've already identified there's a need, you know, to check this, to gather feedback. How do we do that? You know, like, is there a particular existing group or, or mechanism or what kind of group needs to be set up to, to maintain this policy and metrics? Yeah, so RDA or possibly the EOSC, um, ASPSL, the, the legal entity. 
working together with W3C, yeah, or task force to be set up by the governance. Yeah, I think non EOSC members, the RDA should be part of it. I think one thing I'm always um, concerned about is having the people who are, are kind of implementing something also being the ones governing it. So I think we need, there probably needs to be some overlap, but I think we also need some separation there. So um, yeah, research community should be represented in this, this governance or the donor foundation. I think that's important on the PID side of things. I think it's it's really helpful for us if you know different organizations we should be considering here because there may be groups that we should be engaging with because I think we have to set up some kind of task force to review and maintain these things. There should be some kind of working group structure like like we have currently. So the oversight of the process should be with the EOS legal entity. Yeah. And I think that that legal entity will, you know, will need to form some kind of group. So, and I guess my question um, is the extent to which, where you have persistent identifier uh, metric certification policies, to what extent they're done at the same time? Because there's obviously a lot of overlap in terms of. Um, ideas or how you would approach each of those um, and I guess it would there would be benefit in doing them at the same time but there would also be benefit in doing them separately yeah and it's true that we see that uh, knowledge as you said before is important so to have uh, some kind of specific something to deal with each of the types of recommendations is certainly a good point yeah now there's one one comment here which is taking us on to our next question so i'm going to move on so somebody's noted here an independent neutral body could work in close co cooperation with the eos legal entity our, our next question is actually about those characteristics you know what does this governance body or task force that we set up whoever's maintaining the pid policy and metrics what kind of characteristics does it need to have so independent had been mentioned already there um, we've also thought you know perhaps we need to think about representation and if, if we're thinking about that representation of of what groups is it you know making sure that you've got relevant service providers or um, scientific community or diversity again in in what ways might that be important so if there are particular things that are important to you in terms of the governance of the policy and metrics what what are those aspects so independence has come up here in particular from the service providers or from commercial interests making sure it's sustainable i think that's really important international and domain diversity this is actually something we tried to to do when we were composing the fair working group initially because i think fair itself you know means different things to different communities so we tried to make sure we had people from different disciplinary backgrounds and different career stages for that reason um, a not-for-profit a bit like orchid and underrepresented communities that idea of people you know the underrepresented was something that is quite important to me in terms of the feedback um, when we're looking at how the PID policy and metrics are being implemented, if we find certain communities aren't engaging in EOSC, maybe we've set the bar too high or maybe things are not applicable to them, I think we might need to probe into, you know, those communities that are underrepresented and try and understand why. So again, that's an important thing to, to consider. There is a comment, sorry, there is a comment in the chat on transparency, which makes sense. Here it is. Ah, okay. Yeah, from Antonio. Yeah, sorry, I'll scroll down. Um, yeah, so again, independent from commercial interest, being transparent. I think that, that's one of the criticisms we'd had initially about the working groups, that people weren't sure how they were being convened. So I think trying to be clear on the processes and, and how somebody gets a seat at the table, I think is really important. And to say informed by current usage, but yeah. independent is, is a good point too. There are many good points, but this one is one of them. 
Yeah, and I think actually this is the idea of how we convene this kind of maintenance board or task force and and the characteristics it needs. Um, I think that's something we should be putting clear recommendations on in our final um, document. So this is really helpful feedback. So again, I'm I'm gonna just conscious of time. I'm gonna move us on, but um, by all means, keep adding comments because they will um, be in the Mentimeter that we download at the end. Now, one of the question that came up in our work is about the fair principles themselves, because this, this is like the main basis of our work, um, and they've been around for a long time, um, and potentially, you know, they may change or maybe they're fixed. They won't change, but we had this question, do, do we need some kind of governance of the fair principles themselves? Because that's inherent in our work. It's what everybody, not even just EOSC, but other countries and other groups are basing their work around. So currently, most people are saying, yes, they need to be governed. A few people are saying, you know, they're not going to change. So there's not really an issue there. A few people saying other, we're going to... Um, go on but I in a second but I, I don't know if people who say other want to put comments in the chat or speak out so most most votes here for the principles themselves being governed um, or perhaps but you know not urgent um, so let's penultimate question we have here um, is around how they should be governed. I see there's a comment in the chat actually uh, from Keith saying it's not the principles themselves that need to be governed but their implementation. Yeah. Except that when there is a discussion about criteria and implementations people begin to discuss on what the fair principle what is written in the principle yeah so i think i think this add, is sorry to add interpretation in addition to implementation yeah exactly that that was going to be my point so i i think the principles themselves are, pr are pretty static but actually when we've been looking at what it means for different communities to be fair people have very different implementations or interpretations of what that means um so i think some of the context around the principles is really what needs to be governed, not necessarily, well, I mean, there may well be changes in the, the phrasing of the, the fair principles themselves. And I think we do need to make sure that we're all referring to a canonical version. Um, so, so that's important, but, but yeah, it's really that understanding of what it means. I mean, who determines that this, text string means a specific thing or means a specific thing in a certain context. Um, so Andres is mentioning there are already several versions without governance. This is actually why this question emerged for us. I mean, there's not really major changes between, but I've found it difficult to know what is the published version. So there, there's a version on the Force 11 website, which I think was the first um, kind of publication of it, but there have been publications since and there are slight tweaks. And I think this is really why the question had come up for us about the governance. So looking at who should maintain the fair, fair principles, most people are going for an international group. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's really important because they've gone very much beyond, um, you know, beyond the EOS context or beyond the the kind of life science community where it started. So I think it needs to be some kind of very broad group that would look at, you know, the definitions and the implementation there. Brian's put in chat an RDA working group. Yeah, I think it needs to be some kind of, um, you know, open forum really to look at the governance. Um, Rob's just put a clarification. Force 11 was a consultation before publication. One interesting comment is that there is a suggestion it's useful to have an EOSC body to maintain EOSC's interpretation of a principle, which is what yeah. we are supposed to see now, to, to do now. And I think it's good to keep that in mind also. Yeah, exactly. Because within EOSC, you know, FAIR is a set of rules that we're following. So that this has really been my concern that we need to be clear on 
the version that we're using and what our understanding of it is. So I, I actually, my preference is probably towards an international group, but I think we have to be clear about our EOS context as well. There's another comment in chat, Mark say, it maybe makes sense to think about this as a fair culture and set of stories that are told and retold and nuanced. Yes, it's the kind of thing we said in uh, turning fair into reality. But yeah, we need yeah. stories. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So our final question to you is is really a catch all to try and think of things that we haven't addressed here in terms of how we go forward um, with the PID policy and the metrics and the implementation of those. Um, so is there anything that we haven't touched on in this session that you'd like to pick up on other things that need to be addressed in terms of the governance and, and maintenance or, or other questions generally that you had before you came to this session? Again, I'll just give people time to think. It's sometimes hard to formulate your, your questions or comments. Yeah, use cases, we need examples of usage and problems. That's maybe something we could try and uh, set up because we've, we've talked about, you know, how we're gathering the feedback. But I think if we, I mean, within the EOSC work plan, we've, we've focused on two specific use cases um, for this phase of work up to 2020. Um, but maybe we need to ensure that we have um, clear use cases from a range of communities to, to guide that feedback on the, the policy and metrics? I think that the comment on certification is uh, something which is already taken into account since we have a separate document about certification. Yeah. Yeah, so actually we didn't clarify that at the start. So the, um, well, I think you did say, Francoise, the task force that you're chairing um, covers metrics and service certification as well. We're only picking up on the metrics here because there's a Fairs Fair workshop on um, service certification um, as part of EOS Cub Week, I think on Wednesday. Tomorrow. Oh, is it tomorrow? Okay. I think it's tomorrow morning. <laughs> Uh, here, negative answer, uh, examples help by defining what's not to be done, not working. Yeah. But again, about metrics and certification, one of the points is that it should take into account many different things, not only data. And for instance, certification of PID services should be put upon the table, probably, and many and services, and not only data for a certification. So this means lots of work, which has to be done. Yeah. And I like to see trust because trust is at the core of certification and of any system to share data and open science. Yes, yeah, trust is- Yeah, exactly. I was just Thank looking you. at that comment as well. Yeah, I think, I think having the community respect and trust is a really critical element for, for EOSC. You know, people won't engage with and use EOSC if it's not trusted. Connecting to Chris communities, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, current kind of providers or services that would need to engage. Who funds the governance structure? Yeah, that's a, well, I mean, currently, um, you know, this is community supported, um, you know, the governance board members and exec board members and all of the working groups are people volunteering time. Um, the terms of reference for such a body, yeah. So we have um, just about 10 minutes left actually before the break. Um, so I'm wondering if anybody wants to um, raise a question or, or speak out as well, if you do by all means raise your hand, if there's other points you want to pick up on that we haven't really discussed in detail.
Yeah, Andrew has a comment in chat here. Generally, EOS will be a journey, a long road to handle research data properly. I think this is this is one of the concerns I have that, you know, I hope people don't expect that at the end of this year, everything's fully functional. Um, you know, it, it is very much a journey. What we're doing within the working groups, the kind of policies and recommendations we're putting forward, uh, kind of the baseline to get EOSC working but then there's a whole phase of implementation and adoption that's needed um, and you know we've developed a couple of use cases within our work plan to to essentially demonstrate that EOSC works and and start to build from there um, but initially that will be focusing on open data there's many more challenges around you know sharing sensitive data sharing data under certain conditions um, and all of this takes time to to develop and get working well yeah and Andres is saying this is why we need the governance I think the governance is really important so that there's a, a forum you know to gather that feedback Francoise and Rachel are there other things you'd like to to pick up I was just thinking about uh, this question about trust and actually it relates to a couple of the comments we've had back to the question we've got up on the slides at the moment around actually with persistent identifiers to some extent we can measure trust. So someone mentioned about checking that persistent identifiers actually still resolve in 10 years time. I think that's a very big element of whether people actually trust persistent identifiers is that they are persistent. Um, in the kind of timescales people are thinking. So actually there are ways we can measure that trust. I think the other element of trust is about evolution and that when new things come along that are useful, that we make sure that people can use them. Um, and, you know, while we have policies that are very much based on existing workflows, technologies and what works now, we know that's not going to be the same in five to ten years time. Um, and so again, it's about this kind of um, willingness to evolve what we're saying from now into the future, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, yes. and there's a com. Sorry, Sorry go, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to. I was just going to say there's a comment in the chat from Jean Claude Bergelman um, that we should concentrate on the um, overview and, and governance um and let the providers do the work on the ground um, and i think actually the the follow-on from this we can't organize everything on a semi-benevolent basis is really important so uh, there are um, i mean there will be a legal entity established we will be looking at the the funding model for eos but i think you know there needs to be investment to to run the the basis of of eos um and i would like to comment on uh the comments about global partners from KIF. I have seen that we have participants from far away, thanks to yeah. Michia, it's useful. And I think you have seen that maybe you are not the only one to care about global aspects. So yeah. I think it's very good you were here and uh, to, to be involved in the conversation, because when we want to share data, it's global and this, I hope everybody understands that. But this requires to be, to have a, I think that the discussion about having a, an EOSC point of view on global things is also uh, meaningful somehow. Yeah, yeah, and, and Keith also notes that the disciplines are, are global, yeah, which is really important. Research doesn't know those geographic boundaries, so we definitely don't want to be building an EOSC silo. It needs to be something that um, works, you know, uh, across all of these different infrastructures in different continents or countries. I think that's why, you know, engaging through groups like the PID Forum has been really important because then we've connected with, you know, the Australians and the US and um, people in Asia as well. So so working through mechanisms like that or through RDA or, or GoFair, I think it's, it's really critical to try and get that international reach. And Hilke also just commenting again on the, the use cases and success stories, adding an additional vote for that. I think that's, that's really the critical way we need to gather this um, feedback in and make sure that, that the policy and the metrics continue to be relevant. You know, they are things that will need to change in future and should change. And we shouldn't be, be worried about, um, you know, making amendments to those. Yes, going when you have success stories, you also need to know what doesn't work. So it's yeah. the counterpart of it. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, I am tempted if people don't have other comments they want to raise now, I'm tempted to give us an extra five minutes of, of coffee. Um, just to say a huge thank you to Francoise and, and Rachel um, for, you know, essentially convening the session, pulling together the, the questions we wanted to ask about the, the metrics and PID policy and how we govern that in future. Um, we will, um, you know, take all of your comments from the Mentimeter um, so that can feed into the recommendations we, we make in this work. Um, and just a reminder that we do have, you know, these papers out for, for feedback. So um, if there are comments you haven't made yet, by all means, do have a look and, and let us know if you think we're going in the right direction or what adjustments are needed. I also have a comment for Trust IT. Do you, can you save the chat also? Because there are some comments in the chat, not only in the Mentimeter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm pretty sure we can, um, but yeah, we'll make sure we get that. Somebody has also asked about um, the Mentimeter results, if they can be shared. Uh, yeah, they definitely can. I think I might actually be able to share a link just now that um, lets you see that. Let me kind of, can I exit the Mentimeter? Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, let me go to share. Um, presentation sharing link to live results. I'll just pop this in the chat, but we will also make sure that um, we um, we make this available, you know, the results with the, the slides and everything else. So thank you again for all of your comments and feedback and for engaging. Um, I think we have a, a half hour, well, we have a 35 minute coffee break um, and then we're back for the second round of, of sessions. Yes. Um, so, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, yes, now if uh, you are finished, you can leave the breakout room and come back to the main room uh, and just uh, have your break practically. And so you will be reassigned after in the new room. So please leave the room now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.